Well, hi, and welcome to the Christian Contrast Podcast, where we talk about how walking with Jesus leads us to live different than the world around us. I'm Dan Franklin. I'm here with Troy Spillman, excited about a conversation that we are going to have about our all-church goals for this year. Now, just to kind of give some background, so, you know, in any given year at this church, we'd probably have a hundred different goals of just things we're trying to accomplish. But each year, we as a pastoral team and then the elders are involved, we identify two to three core all church goals for the year, just to say these are areas of emphasis and areas of focus. And that's what we want to be able to talk about in this episode today. Yeah, it is, I see these as overarching. These are areas, no matter what our, maybe you could say our specialty is, like whether outreach or life kids, but yet these are overarching themes that we should incorporate no matter what we're about as far as our job descriptions. Yeah. And it, and it may be one of those, maybe a parallel to think of it is that, you know, we're going into these summer months and for each of us as individuals, we might think, uh, you know, what, what is it that that's my goal for this summer? And if we were honest, there would be like, again, a hundred different goals of things that we want to see happen. But we might feel like the Lord is saying, you know what, really focus on cultivating journaling during the summer, or really focus on cultivating your relationship with a particular child that, that you haven't got a strong a bond with. And so it's not to say other things aren't important. It's just to say there are different times where there's areas of focus. And these are three that, that as the pastoral team has prayed this through, as the elders have prayed this through, and there's been a lot of collaboration and talk going into this. These are areas that we feel like, all right, th- these seem like areas of emphasis for this year. And we just want to highlight them in this episode for our church family to be able to listen to, and because it probably will also help make sense of different things that we do during this year as they show up. So we'll just touch on each one, and the first one has to do with prayer. Um, and I'm going to actually just read this, because we kind of we have a vision statement and then sort of a goal definition for all of these. And for prayer, the vision statement is that LBF Church, uh, that the LBF F Church family would be marked by seeking God in prayer. And then our goal for this, we see this as probably a multi-year goal area, but our goal for this year is just to develop and implement a strategy for creating a church culture of seeking God in prayer. Um, Now, Troy, I'm going to go out on a limb. I'm going to say that in your life, you pray. That'd be correct. Fair statement. Yeah. You pray, our people pray. It's not that prayer is absent from us as pastors or from us as a church, but as we all talked about it, we said it probably wouldn't be the thing that people would say marks us as a church, and that's what we're going for. Yeah. Yeah, they say that if you want to solicit some kind of guilt in your church, you talk about prayer. Because I think we all realize, I fall short of this. I, I need to be relying on God in a bigger way. I need to be able to trust Him. And so prayer is evidence of that. Like That's actually put in practice that I'm committing this to the Lord. Yeah, absolutely. And and it is one of those. I mean, humbling is is the word I always think of. And you yeah. know, you talked about not, none of us feel awesome about our prayer life. I've I've yet to meet that person. E- even the the people that I talk to that they describe their prayer life and I think, "Oh my gosh, if if I was doing that, I'd feel like I was miles ahead of where I am now." They still tend to feel like yeah, it's it's not where it's meant to be. And I I think prayer even above reading the scriptures is such a humbling activity because it really is acknowledging our dependence upon God. We're just saying, we, we as a church, we want that to be our instinctive response to God. And we also want it to be something, that, th- this is something that I, I talk to a lot of people who are part of our church, and, and they'll just sort of say, well, like I, I just sort of pray throughout the day. Um, you know, it, when something comes to mind, I pray. Uh, maybe when I'm driving and I don't have anybody in the car with me, I pray or, or things like that. And, and I, I think, it, I, I don't want to say no to that. I think that's great. Pray throughout the day. But there's a special advantage to saying, I'm not just going to pray throughout the day, but I'm going to specifically set aside time to seek the Lord in prayer and not just sort of wait for the moments to emerge. Yeah, to be intentional about it, I think is really good. If you look at those that have gone before us, I got to look at those throughout history. They're those that we remember or quote. They're usually marked by prayer. Hmm. They're, there's all through their life. It's it's a, like cornerstones of what they do. Yeah. And so, you know, a lot of them. It's great to be able to read about like how in the morning they carve out time before the sun comes up or sometimes in the afternoon or evening, but there's a discipline to it as well. 
Absolutely. And, and I think as we talk about this, what, one of the things that we talked about with this goal, even more than the other two that we're going to talk about, is we said, we think that, that, this is this, that this is one where we almost need to start slow, just in the sense that we said, we, we feel like those of us who are pastors and elders really need to go first in this. Um, that, that we need to look at our prayer lives and we need to look at, you know, what, what's getting in the way for us? Where, where do we think God is calling us to be? And again, not to say as, as pastors and elders, we are praying. And we know many people in our congregation are regularly spending time with the Lord in prayer. So it's not to say that this isn't a part of our lives, but again, to say, man, we, we want this to be something where, where when we're launching something new in ministry, where we're saying this will fail without God, and so we're desperately going to them. When we're thinking of our families, which we're gonna talk mm-hmm. about in a minute, when we're thinking of our families to say, our kids will only know Jesus by the grace of, of God reaching out to them, and so we're gonna commit them to prayer. Our marriages will only stay stable and coherent and cohesive through prayer. Our, our preaching will only be successful through prayer. So for us to really say, and prayer is not just sort of a an add-on where, you know, if you're, you're deep in need, I know Jeff Taylor used the analogy of like keeping it in the trunk and then bringing it out if we need it, but that prayer is really what's leading the way in everything that we're doing. And and we as pastors and elders, there are going to be some things this year that the congregation sort of gets in on in this emphasis, but really we're saying, let let's start with us and before we feel like we're in a position to say, here's where we're going with prayer, we really want to just be led by the Lord in that as leaders. Yeah, I'm convicted by a statement Jesus says to his disciples, you have not because you ask mm. not. And I wonder how much we miss out on because we just don't ask. Yeah. We don't stop and rely upon what God has for us. He is like he has a storehouse ready for us but we refuse to ask. We go about our own strength, our own abilities. Yeah, and so just be- before we move on to the next goal, just to say that any LBF Church members and participants, if you're hearing this, it's a great time for you just to say, all right, this is something that the Lord is doing at our church. I wanna dig into this in my own personal prayer life. And then also when things come up, whether it's in a Sunday church service, in our life groups, you know, in, in Life Kids, in, uh, in Exit 83, in any of the ministries, you, you might say, oh, I, I bet I know why this is going on. And I want to respond and be in on this all-church goal that we would really become a people of prayer. Um, now, our second goal is, is one that you were very involved with, with sort of the planning and strategy process as, as we went through this, and that has to do with family ministry. Um, and, and again, I'm just I'm going to read the vision statement and then the goal statement. Then I, I'm going to ask you just to kind of walk through some of the heart behind this. Um, but the vision statement is that families who belong to LBF Church would live counterculturally in a way that places Jesus above all else. And then the goal statement for this year is this, to develop a plan that creates a culture that equips and empowers families to put Jesus at the center of their family life. Um, And Troy, during the planning process, you headed up the team um, along with Summer and along with Lori, and then also Dalton and Ali Sweeney got in on that. But but before it came to the rest of the pastoral team, you headed up the team that just dug into this. And I'd love for you to share some of the things that ended up being on your heart with this. Yeah, I felt like we learned quite a bit as we kind of dug in a little deeper, figure out, okay, what is going on with our families? How are our families just across the board in America doing, particularly as kids get older? And so there's there's this statistic that basically kids tend to leave the faith. The good majority of youth leave the faith between license to license, their driver's license to marriage license. And then there tends to be a little bit of a waking up like, oh, Man, oh crud, I need this. I, I need this back in my life. I'm missing something. But that's a big gap. You're talking age 16 or 18 all the way through like 23, 24, 5. Yeah, yeah even now with people getting married later, that could be a 10, 12, mm-hmm. 15 year gap there. Yeah, it's it's huge. And so what they've done, there's been some studies. And they basically look at families that the youth or their kids didn't veer off. They actually stayed intact. Not perfect, but they, they stayed walking with the Lord. What was different? So they didn't find five different areas that the family instituted early on. So these five, we're, we're kind of making these like uh, what we go to. These would be like our top five. You know, we're even kind of joking around like, make a We'll start off with, we put out these five areas and say, you know, kind of like Panera, pick two. That's right. Start with two. You don't have to start with all five. Start with two and kind of build from there. So here's what they are. One, I love how simple this is. 
They ate dinner five out of seven nights together as a family. And you're like, oh, we only do three or four. I'd say, okay, start working toward doing more because that has an impact that you're doing life together. Usually that's a debrief time. Usually that's a time where you all connect in a meaningful way when you go different directions throughout the rest of the day. So that's huge. Number two, serve with their families in ministry. And I love as a church here, we try to provide opportunities for not just individuals to be able to serve, but as families. We have Community Impact Day, we have Go Teams, we have other opportunities that people can serve together as a family, which is really key. Three would be had one spiritual experience in the home during the week. This could be prayer, this could be a night of worship, there could be some kind of activity of the family. You know, it could be a reading of scripture on a regular basis. And so it could be pretty simple. We tend to complicate these things. Absolutely. The important thing is that you get together. And you talk about Jesus. You talk about the, what's the Lord doing in our lives. Four, entrusted with the responsibility of ministry at an early age. We tend to kind of think, well, we'll, we'll let you do this when you're, when you're adult or when you're older, or at least later in teenage years. But there's things that our kids can do even at a young age. We want to be able to be creative. Sometimes you have to kind of be, okay, how do I modify this for a six-year-old or eight-year-old or 12-year-old? But there are ways to do that. There's pretty simple ways. And then five would be had at least one faith-focused adult in their lives other than their parents. Mm -hmm. So the idea here uh, is that there's someone else, almost kind of like reinforcing what we might speak into their lives, someone else kind of come alongside. I look at my own life. I know that was true. Others spoke into my life and have been used in powerful ways. But I also look at our kids. I know I'm grateful for... There's been young men and women that have spoken into our kids' lives. Yeah, and I and I love I love those five. You know, you guys shared that with us when we were at our staff planning summit, and and just taking all that in. And I think one of the things I love about it, for, first of all, I do look back, and I, and I say this not in a self-aggrandizing way, but I'm like, I I didn't fear, like I, I didn't have a period of time where where I sort of abandoned the church or abandoned the faith. And as as you read those five, I'm like, wow, I I think uh, relatively speaking, all five of those are true for me. Um, and, and that's not a credit to me that, that, that's just a thing that I can be thankful for to say that probably was a part of it. And, and I know probably for some people listening, that can feel, that can feel one of two things that that could feel either overwhelming, like you said, of like, oh my gosh, we're, we're talking about going from like zero to 60, or it can almost feel like, all right, is this, is this a formula? Is this us saying, you know, add these five ingredients and, mm -hmm. and you put it in the oven and it comes out to a child who loves Jesus. And and with both of those, it's it's like, all right, it's it's not legalistic. It's it's not a guarantee. Um, and at the same time, I, I think sometimes we, we can be so afraid of of legalism or formulas that we back off from ever getting tangible. And these five things are actually based on data. That they're, they're not things that we yeah. made up. And so to say like, all right, if we're looking at this and we're saying, man, we we want our kids to thrive and to know Jesus and not to have to go through a painful period that they need to recover from because we do have people like like you said the license to license we're often at sort of license to when you have kids even more so mm -hmm. people have kids and they're like I need Jesus I need help <laughs> I need a church community they yep. come back and thank God they come back but there often is stuff to overcome and there's regrets and mm -hmm. say man we want our families thriving we know we're in a very distracting culture. Um, and, and even with that, I know for me, of the three goals, that this is the one that I felt like God put this goal in our laps. I felt like it would almost be wrong for us not to have this as an area of emphasis. Because over the past year, but yeah, yeah, probably over the past year in particular, we have just had an influx of younger families to our church. Yeah, and I've almost felt like God is saying, I'm entrusting mm -hmm. these to mm -hmm. you. What are you going to do? And and for those of us in leadership, that that's a trust that we can rejoice in to say, well, like God is entrusting these families and these kids to us. Man, we want to steward this well. We we want families to be thriving as as places of grace and joy and as launching pads for our kids, not just for successful careers, but for walking with Jesus for their whole lives. And so we really want to be, using the word again, intentional about that and set up a culture where, man, it is just normal that families are praying together eating together, serving together, reading the scripture together, and shaping our lives with Jesus at the center of the home. Yeah. Yeah. If you look at these, kind of a common denominator with all these is time. 
Yeah. Right? That's really what it comes down to is you're having intentional time together with a spiritual focus, putting the Lord in the middle. And I think the biggest enemy uh, to, to authority in this is our busyness. We, we just have our day just kind of pegged from waking up till nighttime. And then we wonder why our stress levels are so sure. high, even mm -hmm. takes a toll on us physically, uh, because maybe our families are a little dysfunctional because of all of our busyness. And so we're going different directions, hard to even, keep. I'm just trying to keep track of where everybody is. And so there really is a call, I think, to come back to, hey, this is relationship. Yeah. And we need to carve out time for it because it's important. And these show statistically the fruit of it. Yeah, and and likely just for for members of our church family listening to this to to say all right to preview a few things, um, that the plan right now is in the fall there's going to be some intentional events that are actually more focused on just marriage, and then in the spring and by I, I still think in terms of semesters so by spring I mean January yeah um, we're going to have some stuff that's more focused on these five things that you laid out so mm -hmm. for for those of you that you're you're getting a little preview you're probably going to hear a lot more about this once we get to January and and lean into this but don't wait till then if if you heard these five things and if later on you're like hey, I need to be reminded of those I need to rewind get going on this and and do what Troy was saying. If you're like, oh my gosh, we're not doing any of these, choose a couple, just just get going. It's the same thing we say about giving. People are like, I can't give 10%. Start giving 1% and generosity yeah, will build. Right. I can't read the Bible every day. Start reading the Bible two days a week and just let that build. Um, and, and we're excited to see what God does because again, yeah. this is so vital and this is something that God has really entrusted us with as a church and we wanna be good stewards there. Yeah, that's um, right. Uh, and now we'll talk about the third one, and this is the one all church gold that's a carryover from last year, and it has to do with biblical worldview and forming a biblical worldview. So again, I'll, I'll read the, the vision for this, is that the committed member of LBF Church could one, articulate, and two, practice a biblical worldview in core battlefronts in our current culture. You know, we did this series last year called Strongholds, Battlefront Strongholds. Um, the goal that we have for this year is to develop and implement a plan to equip and empower LBF church members with a biblical worldview. Um, now, here's the deal. With, with biblical worldview, to some degree, we're always doing this. Every sermon is this. Every Exit 83 meeting is this. Every, you know, every podcast is this. Everything we do relates to us looking to form our, ourselves into having a biblical worldview and living that out. But there are core battlefronts at different times, and we want to make sure we're leaning into those. Um, and one of them that that we've talked about that we're going to be leaning into a lot this year is the threat of our political allegiance co-opting our allegiance to Jesus, and it being something where it gets kind of backwards, where first we're Democrats, or first we're Republicans, or first we're conservative, or first we're liberal, or wherever it is. And we also happen to be Jesus and maybe try to get Jesus to be our mascot and to say, if we're really letting Jesus lead the way, we're going to frustrate people from all sides of the political aisle. And we're also going to be liberated from the tyranny of having to defend or having to be on the side of one team and alienating ourselves from each other. Yeah, that's right. And if you look at what Jesus was about, kind of the command, I think, even to us today, you know, the idea that we are to love mercy and to do justly, right? Where those are like priorities that come, especially in our interaction with others. You know, how do we live that out? How do we practice that? And I believe as a church, we have some ideas of how we can go in that direction, how we can represent the, wor the Lord in the world in our daily routine. Yeah, and, and you led right into the, the verse that I wanted to read, Micah chapter 6, verse 8, which you just kind of paraphrased there. It says, He has shown you, O mortal, what is good? And what does the Lord require of you? To act justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. Um, and you just mentioned it with justice and mercy being right at the center. Jesus talks about this in Matthew 23 when he's just laying into the Pharisees about how he's like, ah, oh, you'll tithe off your herbs in your garden, mm -hmm. but you cast away justice. And he says, hey, you, you should still be doing the 
the the sort of the these other things you should still be obeying in these other areas but you're neglecting the big ones you know he gives that weird analogy of you know you you use a strainer to get a gnat out of your water but there's still a camel in there how we're missing the big picture and and for me it for for the fall series, un- unless something changes, the current plan is that our fall series is going to center around these concepts of justice and mercy. Um, and part of this, it, th- there's a part of me that's sad because I feel like anytime we talk about justice, there are certain people that that sort of like tense up. Mm. And I'm sympathetic to that because in our culture right now, sometimes the word justice or the term social justice has been co-opted where, where we start to get suspicious and, and say, wait, wait, what are, what are we talking about right now? Are, are we talking about Marxism? Are we talking about sort of like, you know, the LGBT, you know, Q agenda? You know, what, what, what are we talking about here? So it's tough because it's like the word justice for us makes us say, what are we talking about but man, you read the Bible, that this is the core way we're meant to interact with each other is with justice and mercy. And, and justice has to do with equality. It has to do with treating each other as, as image bearers and has to do with just ways that we treat each other. Um, and one of the things that I think is so powerful is that with we can think of, all right, justice is sort of more about fairness and mercy is maybe about letting people off the hook. Um, and we say, all right, both are valuable. But man, you read the Bible and there are times where it gets hard to figure out Mm -hmm. which one's which, because to God, they're so closely mixed together. So we might look at charity and be like, well, charity is mercy. But there are times in the Bible that you read about generous giving, and it's like, the way they're talking about this is kind of more like justice than mercy. There are laws in the Old Testament about how you treat your neighbor, and we can say, well, that's mercy, that's above and beyond. But the way it's couched is often in justice terms. So we want to say, man, in, in a world where we're confused about the term justice and what's justice and what's not, we don't want to lose that. We want to talk about justice and mercy and how these are the things that are meant to mark us in the world as the people of God. Yeah, yeah. If you go through the Old and the New Testament, it talks a lot about our role here, you know, is that God cares about the widow and the orphan mm-hmm. and the foreigner. Those that might not have the same advantages or even resources that we have, but he cares for them. And he left us here in this world for a reason. If it was about just us getting saved, he would have already taken us away. But he left us in this world that we would represent him. I just kind of think of, yes, Jesus is going to come back, but yet we're to represent his work, his kingdom right here in real practical ways. That's why we're here. You know, not just use resources, go about our day, have our job, you know, all that. But yet, it, there's a purpose. There's a bigger purpose for us. There is, and I and I think part of, part of what um we talked about in terms of how we live this out as a church this year is, and you know, all right, we we are going to preach and teach on this, and we're never going to stop doing those sorts of things. That, that that's something that's important. But we also realize, you know, nobody is up there holding up the the picket sign with the word justice and a line through it. You know, nobody's saying oh, I'm against justice. Um, but what we want to do is we want to really make sure that we not only understand the unique biblical value of justice and mercy, but we want to make sure that we're prioritizing how we live this out over things that we sometimes put a higher priority on, which are what political party am I a part of and who did I vote for? Mm. Now, to be clear, nothing wrong with being part of a political party. I, I'm a card-carrying member of a political party. We, we believe that voting is a very good thing for us as Christians to do. So we're not saying those things don't matter at all. What we're saying is sometimes we have the temptation of saying, the way that I know I'm living out justice and mercy is that I voted for the right guy and mm-hmm. I belong to the right party. Mm-hmm. And I just think, go before God with that and have fun. Like that, <laughs> that is not of yeah. utmost importance to God. And even as we think of the, the Upland Community Resource Center, which has just been a beautiful way of us being able to serve our communities. But one of the things that I love is I'm like, man, you could have you could have two people serving side by side at the UCRC. And one of them could be um, somebody that votes for big government solutions and things like that. And you could have somebody that's that's borderline libertarian that thinks that it should all be private charity, but they could both be serving together, living out justice. And that's just a reminder to us of, man, yeah, yeah, vote and pray through things and God will lead you in your vote. But man, if we're really looking at how we're representing Jesus, I, I would love for us to have times where, where we could be the sort of church that somebody would say, oh, I didn't know that's how you voted. And then we would just move on because we're partnering together in justice and mercy. And it's not that our votes don't matter, but man, they're not what define us. 
Yeah, yeah. Uh, one of our slogans that we talk about there at the Upland Community Resource Center is that we want to get people to a better place, right? Whatever the situation is, whether it's a housing issue, it could be employment, it could be food insecurity, or a number of other things. Like during COVID, uh, some people didn't even have money to be able to have a proper memorial or a funeral for a loved one. We we're able to help with that. So we've had these resources come in through different channels. And so it's really been amazing to be able to match this up. Mm -hmm. But yet we have our people really representing the love of the Lord, practically working through the process with people. And I just love it. It's like our people interacting with our community in real practical, tangible ways with real crises that they're going through and come alongside them, kind of put arm around them. Hey, you're going to be okay. We're going to walk with you through this. Absolutely. And I love that. And, and I love that even in talking about this, this isn't something that we're starting from scratch, man. This yeah. is something that God has been working in us for, for the whole time that our church has been in existence, but even with a new emphasis lately. Um, and, and, you know, so there's going to be a fall series about this, but also if you're a member of LBF Church, be on the lookout for when the fall series comes, there's going to be action points. Um, and not just action points that we're saying, go home and pray about this in your own life, which we will, but opportunities that we're going to give for us as a church to say, let's really move on action rather than just saying, have I got the right idea in my head and can I give the right answer, which does matter, but falls flat if we're not living this out. So we're excited about seeing what happens with this. And frankly, also, j just as a quick sort of tagline on this goal with Biblical Worldview, one of the other things that we're gonna be working on this year is just coming up with sort of a resource list slash resource center at our church um, where we can say to people, all right, if you're looking for some help in trying to track down answers to these different difficult biblical cultural topics, whether it has to do with sexuality, mm -hmm. whether it has to do with theolo theological stuff like the Trinity, whether it has to do with justice, whether it has to do with the Bible, all, all these different questions. You know, we're an independent non-denominational church. We don't want people just looking at me or you and being like, we'll just mm -hmm. do what they say. But we wanna expose our congregation to a wide variety of helpful voices that can help us navigate the different biblical you know, issues and cultural issues that we deal with. No book other than the Bible is perfect, but there's some really helpful stuff mm -hmm. out there. And we don't want sort of the idea that something is imperfect to keep us from saying, here's a good person to listen to, here's a good book to read, here's a good podcast to subscribe to, here are helpful voices to help keep us on track with a biblical worldview in a very chaotic world. Yeah, it, there's a lot of confusion out there. So I love that this could help bring some clarity. You Google any of these topics and you'll get such a wide range. Yeah, you've Probably got give options. You a yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so I love that we're, we're really trying to figure out how do we help people navigate through this. Yeah, and so those are things that we can look forward to in this coming year. And, and when I say year, I you know, sort of fiscal year, July to next June, these are areas we're gonna be focusing on. And for those of you who are part of LBF Church, um, just really inviting you to begin to engage in prayer and action on these. And also yeah. hopefully this serves as a preview that when we start talking more about this stuff, you'll think, oh yeah, I, I know that this is stuff that the elders yeah. and the staff and the pastors have been praying through for a while and are convinced that this is where Jesus is leading us to lay some emphasis. Mm -hmm. So we're excited mm -hmm. to see what the Lord does in this. Um, and Troy, thanks so much for taking the time just so we could have this conversation and look to walk through these things. Yeah, and, thank you. Yeah, absolutely. And thanks so much for those of you that took the time to watch or listen. Um, we post new episodes of The Christian Contrast every two weeks, and so we post them on YouTube, and you can also find them on our website, lbf.church, if you want to look up back episodes, or if you want to just comment on this one. We love that interaction. Uh, we'll be back in two weeks with a brand new episode, but thanks so much for taking the time to, to listen, and God bless.